Okay, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Ezekiel once again, and we're going to read from uh, chapter 4. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 1, although last week we did look at the first three verses, but just to get the thought flow, uh, we're going to read uh, the entire chapter, verse 17 verses in this chapter. We're going to be thinking about siege conditions as we're going to be looking at these action uh, messages that Ezekiel gives, and these action messages are all pointing to one thing. You know, it's the coming siege of Jerusalem. So it says in verse 1, Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it, set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thee unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days three hundred and ninety days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days, I have appointed thee each day for a year." Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another, till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Take thee also unto thee wheat, and barley, and beans, and lentils, and millet, and fitches, and put them in one vessel, and make thee bread thereof, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side, three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof, and thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be of shall be by weight, twenty shekels a day, from time to time shalt thou eat it. Thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of an hin, uh, from time to time shalt thou drink. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. Then said I, Our Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came their abominable flesh into my mouth. Then he said unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight, and with care, and they shall drink water by measure, and with astonishment." that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Very, very sobering chapter uh, about the coming siege of Jerusalem. And just a couple of uh, additional comments about verses one through three. We saw this kind of war games uh, that he set up uh, de depicting the siege of Jerusalem. And a couple of uh, things that just to, uh, additional thoughts. One is uh, verse two and three. We, we often talk about repetition of phrases and to pay attention to those. And I don't think we pointed this out last time, but in verse two and three, you'll notice that the phrase against it uh, is mentioned uh, seven times uh, in those verses. And so uh, the thought is this, that uh, the whole purpose for this say, uh, siege is the fact that God is now against this city. It once was his city, uh, but now he's against it. 
And so we, we notice, and lay siege against it, build a fort against it, cast a mount against it. This is a, depicting this picture of Jerusalem. And, and, and again, God is against them. He's not for them anymore. Uh, he's abandoned that. In fact, if you look at chapter 5, verse 8, you read it very clearly. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, even I am against thee and will execute judgment in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And of course, it's a frightening thing when God is against us. Uh, uh, we love the fact that uh, when it says in the scriptures, if God be for us, who can be against us? But boy, when God is against us, we're in serious trouble. And that's the way Israel were, or Judah were. They were in a position where now God was against them. And then, of course, uh, we talked about this iron pan. And it symbolized different things, the fact that God was uh, against them, but also the fact it was kind of the besieging army. Uh, and I thought this was an interesting phrase. Uh, the description of the iron pan is to say this, that the besieging army around the city of Jerusalem would be like a ring of steel. And so that iron pan really depicts that very beautifully. Uh, uh, impenetrable. They won't be able to escape from the siege. It's like a ring of steel around them. But now we move on uh, from verse 4, and we're going to look at the sign of the prophet's position. <laughs> uh, he, he's not only confined to his house on lockdown pretty much for uh, the entire uh, seven and a half years till the siege is, is complete, He's uh, until he hears news of the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, so he's in lockdown. Uh, he's restricted in his movements. But still, he has to come outside, uh, we thought, maybe in the courtway or in the doorway, whatever, and occasionally he'll give these action sermons without speaking. And so we've already seen that he's going to be outside playing war games, and he's got this tile and, and pan and all the rest of it. Uh, now we see another little action sermon that he, he is commanded to give. And so it says in verse 4, it says, Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. And so during this time, he is to lay down on his left side for 390 days. Now we'll think about some of the issues related to that as we proceed but just the very thought of it uh, let me just say this right at the outset sometimes serving god is not convenience there's nothing convenient about this is very uncomfortable uh, at the very least uh, to do that for 390 days this is really uncomfortable and sometimes serving god is not easy it's not about comfort and ease. Sometimes serving God takes us outside of our comfort zone, and we have to be in uncomfortable positions uh, in order to faithfully serve the Lord. Notice as well that the, the thought here is this, that this acting out is connected with their iniquity. In fact, just, just point this out for a moment. Uh, again, we, we have five times in verses 4 through 6, the idea of their iniquity or the iniquity. So let's just point this out again. Key words and phrases. Uh, lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that they shall lie upon it. Thou shalt bear their iniquity. Uh, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. Forty days I have appointed thee each day for a year. So clearly, this action sermon and the length of days that he has to lay on his left side and then on his right side is depicting the iniquity of the nation of Israel and then subsequently the iniquity of the house of Judah. God has laid upon him the iniquity of these things. And so, again, it's um, in this case, it's a day for each of the years of their iniquity. Now, I want you to go back with me just to see that this is not unusual in Scripture of the idea of bearing their iniquity. 
Yeah, look at Numbers chapter 11. I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. I get a little bit of a reverse here, uh, and I'm sure Ezekiel is thankful for this. But in chapter 14, verse 34, uh, we read this, And the number of the days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and shall know my, you shall know my breach of promise. So uh, the children of Israel, because they believed the message of the ten spies rather than the two spies, were to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And it was a year for every day uh, that those spies were in the land. And, and, and of course, the, the point being, uh, so shall ye bear your iniquities. God is, I guess, requiring from them that which was passed, right? There's a, there's a price to pay. And so they are uh, paying a heavy price. Now, when we come as well for, to Ezekiel, uh, it's really a good thing, really, that uh, it wouldn't he wouldn't have to do a year for 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 every day Israel uh, sinned because you get three hundred and ninety plus uh, forty. Uh, it, it, all his life, uh, and that wouldn't be enough for him to be laying on his side uh, to deal with that. So God, in mercy, just allows him to do one day per year but you get the idea the principle is that this is how god often acts uh that there there is a uh, a laying on them the iniquity of the house of israel now let me just say this isn't it a wonderful thing that in our case our iniquity is never going to be laid on us it was laid on him the lord jesus as it were uh, was laid on him the iniquity of us all, and the Lord Jesus bore it on Calvary's cross, and we will not have to bear our iniquity. And so how we're thankful for grace. But nevertheless, just from our purposes, this is what is going on. Verse uh, uh, back in uh, Ezekiel 4, and um, we notice in verse Five, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So left side and then right side. Again, we... we we're emphasizing here that it's connected with their iniquity. This is what he's acting out. And again, in a sense, what, what we could say is this, that, that both Israel and Judah are now about to reap what they have sown. We talked about, as a man sows, so shall he also reap. Well, they have reaped iniquity for 430 years combined. And now... They, God is uh, Ecclesiastes 3.15. Uh, all those years, uh, God was not indifferent. He was uh, taking account of their iniquity. And now payday has come. And they are about to, as it were, bear the punishment, uh, the penalty for their sin. And Ecclesiastes 3.15 We've mentioned it already, but it's a great, great scripture, great, great scripture in preaching the gospel, uh, especially for those that are not saved. Uh, and um, let me just read it to you. Uh, it's Ecclesiastes 3, verse 15, a great gospel text and one that we should be preaching on, uh, just that, that there is accountability uh, and people will give an account for their sin. And so it says, uh, verse uh, Ecclesiastes 3.15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And then he says this, God requireth that which is past. <laughs> and there was, uh, I think it was a Billy Sunday, had a, a great sermon called Payday Someday. And he basically based it on this text that there's a, there's a payday coming. And uh, we're thankful that our payday has already been paid by the Lord Jesus. But nevertheless, uh, we should urge those to respond. So now another 40 days. And notice um, 
verse uh, uh, seven, it says, therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem and thine arm shall be uh, uncovered and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. So not only is he laying on his left side and then on his right side, but there's there's something else. And so he said he's to set his face toward the siege of Jerusalem. And I, I would suggest to you that the thought is this um, kind of model depiction that he set up of the siege of Jerusalem, that he's to set his face towards that. When he's laying on his left side, when he's laying on his right side, he's got to keep looking in that direction towards that kind of war game scenario. And at the same time, uh, his uh, he says, um, and thine arm shall be uncovered and thou shalt prophesy against it. So again, uh, his arm is uh, to be uncovered, pointing to it. I'm pretty sure he got a, a good suntan on that arm <laughs> uh, because it was out for 430 days and it was pointing in that direction. So what's the significance of, of this uh, teaching here? Well, first of all, that phrase, set thy face, uh, it means uh, steadfast purpose, uh, symbolically. Uh, when when it talks about somebody setting their face, it has the idea that they have a steadfast purpose and God has a steadfast purpose to require from them that which is past. He's gonna, he is gonna bring these things about. And so where do we get that from? Let's just look at how that set thy face is used in the word of God. And so we just wanna look at how that phrase is used elsewhere, Leviticus 17 and verse 10. 17 verse 10, he says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourneth among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. Okay, so there's an example. God is saying, I'm going to set my face against that person. I'm going to cut him off. So it's kind of, uh, God has a steadfast purpose. You do this, there'll be consequences. Uh, look at, uh, again, Leviticus chapter 20. And we'll read uh, from verse 3. It says, And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch, to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from that, the man, which he giveth of his seed unto Moloch and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off. And all that go whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people. And the soul that churneth after such have familiar spirits and after wizards uh, to go whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul and cut him off from among his people. So you can see it's always that God has a steadfast purpose and it's it's to do with judgment. It's connected with judgment for iniquity, like they're giving your seed to Moloch is when they would offer their offspring as a burn offering to this God Moloch who desired that, wanted that, uh, kind of liken it to the modern day abortion industry, uh, the offering your seed to Moloch, that kind of thing. And then, of course, uh, going after wizards and all the rest of it. We, we don't, don't need any explanation to that. One other scripture I'd like to bring before us in terms of this phrase, set thy face. And that is in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 50. And this is a uh, uh, one of those servant songs in the book of Isaiah that is revealing to us the coming Messiah. And uh, I love these servant songs, uh, wonderful messages in each of them. Uh, and so it's clearly talking about the Lord Jesus. Uh, and it says, For the Lord God, verse 7, will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. And of course, uh, the Lord Jesus had a steadfast purpose, didn't he? And he set his face. What was his face set for? It was set to go to Jer Jerusalem, where outside the city, he would bear the iniquity 
of the human race. God would lay upon him the iniquity of us all. And so again, it's connected with judgment and, and this steadfast purpose. But in this case, it's not him meeting out judgment. It's him bearing judgment. And oh, thankfully, the Lord Jesus was steadfast. Despite all the opposition towards him, the discouragements on the way to the cross, he was steadfast. I have set my face like a flint. Now, just one other thing to look at, and that is, uh, thine arm shall be uncovered. What does that mean? The uncovering of the arm, what's been symbolized here? Again, Isaiah, if you kept your finger there, I hope you did, chapter 52, just over the next page, verse 10, it says, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And so again, it's to do with God acting in power. And so again, when he, so, so again, in bringing this siege, uh, what we could say is this, God has set his face against Jerusalem. He has a steadfast purpose, and that is to punish them for their iniquity, and his mighty arm is being laid bare, and his power will be seen in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Notice verse 8, uh, he says, Behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. So he's not going to turn. Now, again, if you're laying on one side for a long time, the thing you want to do more than anything else is turn. <laughs> and he's going to be bound. He can't turn. He's going to be in that condition, and there's no turning. Uh, no turn until you've ended the days of the siege. So after symbolically standing in the place of God, as it were, Ezekiel now stood in the place of Jerusalem, restrained and helpless before God and his coming judgment. In a sense, he's depicting the fact that uh, that's the way the nation is going to be. Now, here's where this chapter gets complicated and difficult, and that is, Trying to understand the 390 days and the 40 days. What do they really refer to? And so, um, obviously, we know it refers to the iniquity of the children of Israel and the children of Judah in past days. But some have tried to kind of find, well, when did that iniquity begin when did it end what period is connected with the 390 days what period is connected with the 40 days so i'm going to give you three um solutions that have been put forward by bible scholars and you'll have to make your own decision uh, i i feel the jury is still out uh, maybe one of the questions that we'll ask ezekiel when we get to heaven is uh, what were the 390 days referring to <laughs> what uh, 390 years in israel's history were being referred to uh, uh, what about those 40 days uh, and we'll maybe he'll give us a good explanation because uh, it's 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 not easy so let me just give you the three possibilities first of all let me just say this the septuagint translation okay remember that was the first ever bible translation it was a translation of the old testament and uh, 70 jewish scholars uh, translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. That's what we call it, Septuagint, because of the 70 scholars that were involved in it. And this uh, also, uh, this uh, Septuagint translation, it changes the numbers here. And instead of 390 days, it has 190 days. Interesting. Um, and so, some have suggested that uh, those 190 days, he would spend 150 days on his left and 40 days on his right. That's what they they say. And, and of course, they're trying to make it fit with something, you see. That's why they're doing this. And what they'll say is the period of deportation under Tiglath-Pileser in 735 BC. And that's found in 2 Kings 15, verse 29. Well, maybe I'll just read that. It's when uh, Israel were taken into uh, captivity uh, when uh, they were uh, went into Assyria uh, as a, a result of the judgment of God. 
And so 2 Kings 15 and verse 29, we read about this. And it says, In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijon and Abeleth, Mecha, and Genoa, and Kadesh, and Azor, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. Now, we know exactly the date of that, 734 BC. And if you calculate from that to the fall of Jerusalem, it would be 586 BC, gives you 140 years, approximately 150, which goes with the 150 that they say should be on his left side, and then 40 years on his right side. The 40 years of Judah responds approximately to the period 586 to 536 BC, the time of Judah's exile in Babylon, which again is not 40 years, but it's kind of uh, actually more like 70 years. So again, it's, it again just shows how people are desperately clutching at straws to try and make this fit. And whatever whatever they do, it's hard to make it fit. I mean, let me just say, I utterly reject view number one. Uh, because again, I believe the Masoretic text of the Old Testament is exactly accurate, even down to the numbers. And so why change the text of Scripture to fit your theory? I think you need to base your theory on this text of Scripture. The text of Scripture says 390 days. I'm going to stick with that. So I'm going to reject that one out of hand. But I'm just telling you, this is these are some of the difficulties that people are coming up with. Uh, second one holds that there's no question about the number of the Hebrew Old Testament. So they accept the 390 years. Uh, so that's not a problem for them. And so therefore, the longer period must be reckoned from the disruption of the kingdom under Rehoboam, son of Solomon. Okay, that's First Kings chapter 11, verse 31. Remember when uh, the tribes divided, instead of 12 tribes of Israel, you had the northern kingdom, 10 tribes, and then you had the southern kingdom, uh, Judah and Benjamin. Uh, this, and so they were known as the Judah, whereas the 10 were known as Israel. And so 1 Kings eleven thirty one it says, And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. Well, that rending of the kingdom, giving ten tribes uh, if we calculate that, um, uh, it it gives us a period from there, uh, from Rehoboam uh, to um, the destruction of the temple and, and the destruction of this Jerusalem. It gives us a period of 394.5 years, which is approximately the 390 years. So that's good. Uh, we, that that makes a lot of sense. Okay, it goes from from the 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 breakup of the kingdom under Solomon all the way to the destruction of the temple, uh, and that gives us three hundred ninety four point five years. And so that's all well and good. But what do we do about the forty years of Judah? Where does that fit? Uh, because the kingdom of Judah lasted one hundred and thirty six years after the fall of Samaria. So how do you fit the forty years? So this is how they assign it. Two different options. One is they say, well, it's the reign of Solomon. Okay. How, I didn't think that was a big iniquity time. That was, it was in Solomon's life, but I don't think it was in Israel or in Judah. The other thing they say is if you think of Josiah and his reforms, um, from his reforms, which is 625 BC to the fall of Judah, 585 BC, is 40 years. And even though these reforms were made by the king, the people went along, but their hearts were really unchanged because as soon as the king died, they went back to their old ways. And so they would say, okay, that's your 40 years of Judah's iniquity uh, from, and certainly the last 40 years uh, were times of great iniquity. So that's, View two, now here's view three, and this I'm going to be brief. Just want you to know that there, there are challenges in some of these studies of Scripture. Some of it's not easy. Some of it uh, we, we can't be dogmatic about. We have to say, well, these are the different options. 
And so here's one. Al altering the text, it, we, we believe, is not the way to solve the problem. There are no textual reasons not to accept the numbers as they are. The passage makes it very clear that each day Ezekiel lay on his side represented a year during which the nation would bear the burden of judgment for past iniquity. All numbering in the book of Ezekiel, though, is rendered according to the captivity of Jehoiakim, which happened in 597 BC. And therefore, instead of going backwards, maybe the thought is going forwards, not backwards. And if you add the 390 to the 40, so 390 for Israel, 40 for Judah, it gives you 430 years following the captivity of Jehoiakim, if you do that, you'll find you go from 597 BC to 167 BC. That was the year of the Maccabean Revolt. Now, we read about that in First and Second Maccabees and uh, in the Apocrypha, which is not inspired, but it is Jewish history, and it really did happen, uh, although... Uh, it doesn't claim to be inspired the apocrypha but it is interesting from a historical perspective anyway going forward that would that would the maccabean revolt began the jews once again exercised rule over the land of canaan and they had 80 years of jewish independence before the romans came and invaded the land and so they say well this is the bearing of the iniquity is for that period going forward from Jehoiakim to four, uh, 430 years uh, to the Maccabean Revolt when the burden of foreign oppressors would be lifted for 80 years and Jews would experience independence. And so that would be the final thought. So just to conclude, whatever method we use to calculate the mathematics of this sign, the message is clear. God has been long-suffering toward the sinful people of Israel and Judah. Eventually, there came a time after much provocation when their sins caught up with them and they reaped what they had sown. The binding of the prophet and the bearing of his arm spoke a future binding of the prisoners and the bearing of God's right arm in judgment. Now, another question that is raised concerning the prophet and his posture was, did Ezekiel lay there for 24 hours a day, seven days a week? That would be one year and 65 days <laughs> that he would be laying on his side. Now, all I can think about is pins and needles. I don't know if you use that expression, but you know how you stay in one position too long and <laughs> you, your blood gets cut off and you get, we call it pins and needles. I don't know how you would describe it, but, but it's very uncomfortable. I would suggest to you that Ezekiel didn't lie that way 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the reason for that is what comes next in the chapter. He has to bake bread. Well, you can't bake bread laying on your side. Okay? So it would seem to me that for a part of every day, he lay on his side. Every single day outside his house, this had to be seen. It was, it was a sign. It was meant to be seen. I don't know how long, but at, during that course of that day, he would have to break off and he would have to bake himself some bread and he would eat the bread and so and get some water and so that would uh, seem to imply that it wasn't a 24 7 experience so speaking of the bread let's move on now from verse 9 through 17 and we're going to think about the sign of the defiled bread the first two action sermons showed the reality of the siege the certainty of the siege it's going to happen God has set his face. There's, there's no turning back. This is God has got a steadfast purpose to cause this siege to happen. The next two will reveal the horror of the siege. We should probably envision him adopting his prone position for several hours each day 
And then while the audience watched, eat one small bite of the loaf that he's about to bake. So this is kind of the picture. that They're looking at this. They're watching him. So let's read from verse 9. It says, Take thee also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and pitches, and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. Now, in times of scarcity, it is customary in all countries of the world to mix several kinds of coarser grain with the finer to make it last longer. Scarcity of food in the siege made necessary the mixing of all kinds of grain in bread. I remember we uh, went to the, so some of us went to the Soviet Union uh, in 1989, and uh, sorry, 1994, uh, it, it, the walls had fallen, but there was still a lot of poverty. And uh, we stayed in, in this hotel, and uh, we had the same food every single day. And they said that the sausages combined whatever they could find plus cardboard. <laughs> and they certainly tasted like that, I have to say. In fact, uh, at the end of our trip, we went to a McDonald's in Moscow, and I've never seen as many Big Macs consumed. <laughs> people were we were we were hungry. The food because again, people didn't have a lot. They said that who knows what went in there? Scrapings off the floor, uh, rats. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, it was, it was poverty uh, demands uh, that you have to cut corners. You can't have the the finest of the wheat, and so uh, all kinds of grain were mixed in bread in the bread and of course you had three grains you had wheat again which would be the preferred one and then barley which was always considered the, the poor man's bread and then spelt or fitches which would be spelt often that spelt would be would be actually planted around the grain just trying to keep it separate uh, but it wasn't considered to be very palatable so wheat barley and spelt and then two vegetables or legumes uh, beans and lentils they were ground into flour and baked. The combination would make the poorest kind of bread and depict the scarcity of the siege. Ironically, today, my wife and I, we eat Ezekiel bread. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's not cheap. Uh, is it? Oh, there we go. Uh, Raymond eats Ezekiel bread as well. <laughs> and uh, uh, But it's healthy. And that's the interesting thing is that uh, the, the, these various grains are coarse and therefore give good uh, healthy roughage. And enough said, we won't go into any more details. That will suffice. But I just, you get the picture that uh, here it was poor. It was kind of the poor, the, the wealthy. They always had the finest bread ground uh, with fine flour. And uh, here uh, it's coarse, it's rough bread made up of a combination of things. And it certainly would make the poorest kind of bread depicting the, sh the coming scarcity in the siege. Also, the shortage of fuel in the siege is going to be emphasized as well. And this is the defiling part. It has to be cooked on human excrement or dung. Of course, this was clearly a violation of the Old Testament law. This was considered to be unclean. So let's just look at some scriptures. Uh, go back to Deuteronomy Please, Deuteronomy, of course, the Jews, this is going to be a problem for them. They were going to be faced with uh, eating things that were non-kosher in their captivity conditions. Immediately springs to mind is Daniel and his, and his companions, right? They, they're going to be fed by the king's meat, and uh, they consider it to be defiling to them. Uh, chapter 14 of Deuteronomy, verse 3, thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. Deuteronomy 23, of course, uh, human dung would be considered to be abominable. So let just prove that. Uh, verse 12, thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle. See Deuteronomy 23, verse 13, thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad that thou shalt dig therewith and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of the camp to deliver 
thee, and to give up thine enemies before thee, therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. So clearly, human waste was considered to be an unclean thing that had to be buried outside the camp. So here's uh, the difficulty. Now let's look at uh, Leviticus just for a second. Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. And we'll, this is kind of a lengthy reading, but it's necessary uh, to get an idea of what God had promised them if they failed to keep his covenant. So verse, verse 14, we'll read down to verse 29. And uh, it says, But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgment, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you. There's his face set again. And you shall be slain before your enemies. They that uh, hate you shall reign over you. You shall flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power, and I make your uh, heaven as iron, your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield or increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me, and I will not and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number. Your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me, by these things, but walk contrary unto me, then I also will walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you and shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send a pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the, here's the key point, when I have broken the staff of your bread, 10 women shall take your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And if you will not... For all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me. Then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. So even down to be so hungry, they'll resort to cannibalism. Now we'll, we'll see that when we get to chapter 5. But I just want you to get the picture here that one of the things God is going to do is take away their staff of bread. And of course, during this siege, bread is scarce and it has to be measured by weight. And so again, let's go back to our, our text in verse 10. It says, and thy meat, which thou shalt eat, shall be by weight. Twenty shekels a day from time to time shall thou eat. Thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of a hin. From time to time shalt thou drink. So, Food and water have to be eaten out in measured amounts. Now, again, they're not going to Weight Watchers. This is not a deliberate choice. This is, they have no choice. Uh, the circumstances require it. And uh, no doubt uh, during the ensuing battle uh, and during the siege, a lot of cattle uh, would have to be slaughtered. That would make a shortage of, of cooking on, on animal dung. Right, because if your if if your cattle is being slaughtered to eat um, during the siege, but now they're weighing out bread, approximately eight ounces of bread. Uh, that's what um, the equivalent here would be, or two point uh, two hundred and twenty seven grams of bread every day, and then two thirds of a quart of water, or 0.62 liters of water. The thought is this: that if you eat that every single day. First of all, you lose weight. But 
not only that, it's scarcely enough to keep a man alive. Such portions of bread and water rather fed death than the man. And so I want you to get this. This is Ezekiel, God's prophet. You talk about a prophet who had to deal with inconvenience, laying on his side 390 days, and now he's put on a diet that which is almost a starvation diet. And he has to eat that every day throughout the siege. And so Ezekiel, I suspect, by the time he got towards the end of this, you could see his, and count his ribs. <laughs> he would have really lost a lot of weight. And all this is to, to give a picture of the conditions that will occur during the siege. During famine conditions, people try to make their limited resources spin out as much as they can, and that's exactly what's going on. And then, of course, we said the fuel thou shalt eat, uh, verse 12, it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. Again, demonstrating the desperation of a siege. Uh, but also, not just the desperation of a siege, but also the misery of exile among the Gentiles, where care for keeping kosher food and its preparations were going to be almost impossible. Now, we know that dried animal dung was used as fuel in the East, and still is to this day, but it was not regarded as ritually unclean. However, in the siege, as we've already said, all cattle would be killed for food, so only human excrement would be available for fuel. And so, again, uh, they're in a city, city of Jerusalem. Uh, there's a, a ring of steel around it. They can't go out and get firewood. They don't have electricity. Uh, and so how are they going to cook their food? They're, they're going to get to the point where the only solution is to cook using human excrement as a fuel. Verse 13 the law said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles where I will drive them. Because the big lesson is this, children of Israel will eat defiled bread amongst the Gentiles. Remember again, Daniel chapter one, where these captives are faced with a non-kosher diet provided by the king. And of course, they took a stand for God concerning the king's meat. Of course, always good to ask ourselves, where will we take our stand for God? At what point do we draw the line and say, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. Uh, we, we always think of these men as our heroes, uh, Daniel, Daniel and his three friends, because they took a stand rather than accepting compromise because of the conditions. Verse 14, we have Ezekiel appealing to God now. He says, then said I, our Lord God, behold my Soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth, even up till now, have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came there abominable flesh in my mouth. And uh, doesn't it remind you? Uh, does it remind you of any other passage? I, I can't help but think of Acts chapter 10 when I think of Ezekiel appealing to God and he's saying, God, I, I, I've never eaten anything unclean. And uh, let me just read from Acts chapter 10 when he's um, told to rise, kill, and eat as he sees this net full of things that he considered to be unclean. And uh, God tells him that now he has cleansed these things. But in Ezekiel 10, verse 14, Peter says, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And so, again, these, these Jews were pretty serious about being kosher, eating that which God had told them was clean and avoiding that which he had determined to be unclean. But in the bringing down of that net, he made a massive change. And now he said, God has cleansed these things. They're not common anymore. But verse 15, uh, then he said to me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. So God actually makes a concession uh, so that he doesn't, as it were, defile Ezekiel's conscience. But when it came to Peter, he doesn't get any concession, he just gets an explanation. 
the explanation is that God is now taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And in order to facilitate that, you have to eat with somebody before you share the good news with them. And so he's taking down the barriers. But in, in Ezekiel's case, he accommodates the prophet. So notice now, uh, verse 16, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment, that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. So God is emphasizing what the application of this is. A terrible siege was coming to Jerusalem and both bread and water would be cut off. The siege would bring anxiety and dread to Jerusalem. They would waste away because of their iniquity. And so the purpose of all these action sermons was to impress the people with what was coming. Famine during the siege of Jerusalem and the people's subsequent pollution in exile amongst the heathen. Thus their sins would bring them to the extremist want and shame. Extremist want and shame. And so we could say this in uh, concluding this morning, that sin is always a withering experience. It causes shrinkage of the soul and the soul's capacity for God. It's also a defiling and a degrading thing. And so we need to be serious in our own lives about dealing with sin because sin does have consequences. And certainly we can see that for the nation of Israel. But also we're thankful this morning, aren't we, that the Lord has laid upon him, the Lord Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And oh, how thankful we are for the one who hung in shame on that tree to redeem our souls to God. May God encourage us with these thoughts.